In this video we're going to take a look at some of the web challenges from the NahamCon CTF 2022. The first challenge is called Jurassic Park and the description says Dr. John Hammond has put together a small portfolio about himself for his new theme park, Jurassic Park. Check it out here. So we've got a service connect to, we don't have any files to download for this one. Open up the website and see what we've got. We might want to have a look at this Wappalizer first of all to see if we've got any interesting technologies being used. We can have a scroll around the page, we've got some links, we can have a look to see do they actually go anywhere, they don't. And at the top, these are just redirecting to the anchors on the same page. So nothing that seems to be particularly interesting here. Let's have a look at the source code. We could have a look through this and see if we've got any interesting files. We could just have a look to see if we got a flag on the page, which we don't. What about the JavaScripts? These look like they're just imported from some libraries. Okay, let's go back again. Let's open up our dev tools and we can have a look to see if we've got any cookies or anything of interest here. We could reload the page and have a look at our network requests and see is there anything of interest in here. So we've got any interest in headers or anything like that, which we don't seem to have. So what I did here was go to robots.txt, which is kind of a classic thing to check in a CTF competition, which I actually, as of recently, have been checking less and less because I just kind of forgot about it, but um, yeah, we have a look here, we've got this robots.txt file which is essentially just telling crawlers to ignore this directory, so if Google is indexing websites for its search engine, whenever it crawls this website it knows don't put anything from this ingen folder, don't put this folder in the search engine results, don't crawl it, don't see what's in there, but it doesn't actually make it inaccessible, so we can actually just go and have a look and see, this is a directory which exists on the server and if we try to access it we can see we've got this flag.txt we'll open that up and there's our flag we could have also done this using some kind of directory busting or file brute forcing tools so durbuster, gobuster, ffuf, wfuzz etc let's have a look tldr gobuster so we could use a command like this where is our directory mode directory mode url we pass in the url and then we pass in a word list Typically in CTFs this won't be required, most commonly CTFs don't actually have directory brute force and isn't normally part of the challenge, however that's quite often because of the performance issues, they say don't use any brute force in tools against the server. More often than not nowadays capture flag competitions as you can see have your own instances, so I guess that's not so much of an issue, resources will be allocated dependent to each instance, so using GoBuster or SQL Map or some other automated tool like that shouldn't really have much of an impact on other players as all the resources are separated out but uh, it's not needed anyway but that's two different ways that you could solve this challenge. The next challenge is called Extravagant and the description says I've been working on an XML parsing service it's not finished but there should be enough for you to try out and we're told that the flag is in var www we've got a service connect to again we don't have any source codes download so let's go and open it up we open it up, we can have a look around here again, see what links work and what don't. That one doesn't work, doesn't work. The trial one does work, so we've got a file upload feature. About, we've just got some information. Welcome to the Extravagant XML. We provide XML related services. To try out our XML parsing services, upload a sample on the trial page and view it with the View XML page. So we've got some instructions there. We know that we can go and upload a XML file here and then go to the View XML location, let's just try even just for dub dub dub, see what we get. Alright, so it doesn't come back with anything, but we can see we've got this file option. Sometimes this would be related to file uh, local file inclusion or directory traversal vulnerabilities as well, so you could try and go back and see can you do something like that. Uh, but we can't, so let's go and check out this XML feature. Now we might want to just put together a sample XML file or go and look for a sample file to try out first of all. I'm just going to go straight to Hattrix. So let's search for Hattrix XXE in this case. Although if you didn't know what you were looking for here, let's just search XML injection because we should still get the same sort of results. Let's open up this link. So what is XML? Extensible markup language, similar to HTML, although HTML has predefined tags, so you have your HTML, your body, your header tags, things like that. XML doesn't have those predefined tags, so you can put whatever 
elements you want in there. It's just a way of representing data. And the important thing is these XML entities. So XML entities are a way of representing an item of data within an XML document instead of using the data itself. So kind of like a variable inside the XML document. And we can potentially use this to read local files. So you can see down here we've got custom entities and an entity is defined where they've defined my entity and they've put in a value, which is fine, but that's not going to help us. They've also got some examples where they create an entity, in this case system, and this one loads a website and this one loads a local file. We want to try and load a local file. So let's see if we got an example of a better payload down here. Here's one to read the etc password file. So let's take a copy of that. Let me create a, let me just open up Sublime. We'll paste this in here and we want to read for dub 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 and then it's probably flag or flag.txt. We could change the name of this, oh not the name of that, change the name of this. So this is our entity you can see here and it's being referenced here. So we don't need to change it but let's just change that to a flag. And I'm going to save this then as benign.xml. Save that and let's go to our upload. We'll submit that. Upload was successful. Let's go back. Let's go and view it. Presumably we just need to put in the name of the file we've just uploaded. Oh no, that wasn't it. <laughs> it was benign. And there we go. We have our flag. The next challenge is called Personnel and the description says A challenge that was never discovered during a 2021 Constellations mission, now ungated. And we've got a service to connect to. I'll open this up but we've also got some source code to take a look at. So let's have a look at the site first of all. You might want to just go and try and put something in here and see what comes up. Can we put in a normal character? We can. So just a standard search functionality. I tried to put in a quote there just to see if we get any errors from like a SQL injection or something like that, but we didn't. We could try and put in some script tags and see if we get any reflections, but it doesn't look like there is. So let's go ahead and take a look at the source code. We've got this app.py file. I'm going to open it up in Codium. So we've got a Flask application. We can see render template here, so there might be some kind of server side template injection. We can see that the flag is open, so we've got flag, we've got users, and the flag is going to be appended to users. So it's reading the flag out of flag.txt, it's reading all the users out of users.txt. So the last user in this users list should be our flag. And then let's see what we've got here. We can make a get request, and it's just going to open up this lookup.html. We can make a post request and provide a name and a setting as well. And if the name is provided, it's going to check if the first character is uppercase. If it is, it's basically going to get rid of that first character. And then the results, it's using regex here, regex find all, as we can see the function details here. And it's looking for, so this star means zero or more. So it's looking for zero or more, and these are our character sets. So zero or more, lowercase or uppercase letters. The question mark here just means that it uses it's non-greedy, so it will try to match this in as little reps as possible. And then it takes the name, so it's looking for zero or more characters, either lowercase or uppercase, followed by the name that we provide, which might be modified here. And then it's got another statement here, so then it's looking for zero or more lowercase characters. And then it's going to return those results and bring those back to us. So we can potentially inject something in here. So it's asking for the name. We can basically just modify this regex statement. So it's looking for zero or more characters followed by something followed by zero or more lowercase characters. Now we know that we can use, well in regex we can use something like dot star to say we want to match everything, which means that whenever it's looking through these users, Presumably our flag has a curly brace in it and it's got numbers as well. So it wouldn't be matched by this stuff here. But if we were to go and put in our own statement, it doesn't have to be a dot star, it could be something else. But a dot star will basically just match everything. Now the only other thing is we may need to be concerned about this setting as well. Because there may be a different setting for different users or for the flag as well. So let's go and try it out. Let's go to, let's see if we can just do a dot star here first of all. And does it bring back everything? 
It does. Do we see a flag in here? We don't. So what I'm going to do, we don't actually need to do this necessarily, but I'm going to go to Burp Suite. I'm going to send this to the repeater. And we could just go and play around with these settings, change that to 1, see what happens. Actually, we get an error when that happens. Change it to 2. We don't get an error this time. And we could go through and have a look to see do we have our flag. We actually do have it this time. But let's just assume that there was more than two settings here. So we could also right click send this to the intruder and simply just go and loop through the possible settings. So if we add a whatever those little symbols are called, let's go and add some numbers here. So we'll create a list of numbers. We'll go from 1 to, let's say, 99. Step in one at a time. And we'll do one digit. It's the max, sorry, minimum. Two digits is the max. And we're not interested in fractions. Let's put zero there. So there we go. It's going to loop through 1 to 99. And then what we also probably want to do is just say that we want to look to see when our flag is in the response. So flag any responses that have the flag in them. And then we can go to our, let me change that to zero. Let's do our start attack. And we could have a look at this by the length, or we can have a look at now by this flag column. And we can see that we've got a one whenever it, two is used. We've also got a one whenever 10 is used as well. So that would have been fine. And we can go and have a look at the response and see is the flag here. We could have also grepped out this flag as in extracted it and had that as a column here as well in the intruder. The next challenge is called Flask Metal Alchemist, and the description says, Edward has decided to go into web development. He has built this awesome application that lets you search for any metal you want. Alphonse has some reservations, though. He wants you to check it out and make sure it's legit. So we've got a service connect to. We've got some files to download for this one as well. We're told that this flag doesn't follow the usual MD5 hash style format, but instead is a lowercase flag with underscores in it. So let's open up the link first of all and take a quick look. As we usually do, we might want to go and try and put a quote or something in here and see if we get any errors back. Try a double quote. And we don't, we could try and go ahead with some SQL injection. So we're trying to say search for, well, let's say search for A or if one is equal to one, bring back the results. This should bring back all results, and it doesn't. So there's probably not too much else to look at here. We could have a quick look at the source code, but we've already got the server-side source code to take a look at, so there's no cookies there. All right, let's jump over to Codium and see what we've got. There's a couple of different files here, app.py, database, models, and seeds. I'm gonna open up this whole directory and let's work our way through here. So we've got a Flask application. We can see whenever we, you can make a GET request or a POST request to the main page. And there's not really much for a GET request, but the POST request will look for a search parameter in the request form. So let's go to Burp Suite. Let's see what happened whenever we made that request. You see we've got this search parameter down here and we've got an order parameter as well. And the order was this sort by option that we have. So it takes a search parameter, it takes an order parameter, and if there's no order supplied, it's just going to use this query.filter, and it's looking for metal.name.like, and then whatever we provided is going to be formatted in there. Otherwise, if we provided the order field, it's going to use this instead. So it's going to filter. This is actually... So this looks like the same code as we have here. The only difference is... We've got this dot order by text order, and there's no formatting being done on that either. And then it's going to render the template, and that's about it. So we could go and have a look at this metal class. This contains the atomic number, the symbol, the name, and they are the sort fields here. And then we've got a flag class as well. So we've got a table called flag, and then we've got a column called flag, which has a 40 character flag in it, or can hold a 40 character flag. We've got a seed here as well, so this is fill in the database, it's fill in the metals database with all these different metals. And then we've also got the flag as well, so the flag's been opened and it's been added to the database as well. To the flag database, that is. 
Okay, did I miss anything? We've got this database class, it's just creating an SQLI database, so this is important that we know what type of database it is, so that we know what the syntax and stuff is going to be. So there was a similar challenge to this in the Hack the Box Cyber Apocalypse last year, which John Hammond did a great video on. It's a little bit different, but it was still a order by SQL injection. So you notice that we couldn't use our quote of like, or one equals one. But we can use this order by to inject SQL into. The problem is we still can't use that. We can't just exit the quotes by putting in a single or a double quote. But we can use a nested statement. So we can put inside of this order another SQL statement that will be executed. So I'd recommend going and checking out the video John Hammond did for that. It was, really, it was you know, 20, 30 minutes and really went through it in a lot of depth. Uh, I would recommend it. But I'm just going to copy and paste here a very similar command that was used in the previous challenge, although a little bit different, the tables were different and stuff like that. But essentially what we have here, we have this nested statement. This is not going to go in here, this is going to go in our sort by. So we're still going to be just searching as usual, we don't actually need to search for anything. But the sort by is going to have this statement in it and say, this is just like an if statement, so it's case and instead of saying if it says when. And we're saying when, when we select the substring of, from the flag, from the flag table, so the flag column from the flag table, we're selecting the first character, so from 1 to 1, as a substring, and we're saying if that equals f, then order by name, else order by atomic number, and then descending, this doesn't really matter, it's just, you'll need to know, just depending on how you pass the results at the end. Uh, so, if we take that, let's go to, let me, let me send this to the burp repeater, let me just change that search. We don't need to search for anything here. And then in the order, I'm going to paste this into order. I don't think we might need to URL encode it. You can do Control and U or Control Shift U to un to decode it. So Control U, Control Shift U. We'll hit send, and let's go and have a look and see what we get. So we're asking it: Does the first letter of the flag equal F, which it should do? And we want to see how is it ordered. So at the moment, it's ordered by. We've got this 40, which is zirconium. Okay, what if we change this to an L? So the first character shouldn't be an L. Let's scroll through. And this time we have livermorium. So essentially what we're seeing there is if the condition that we ask it to, we're asking it does the first character equal in this case L, and it's returning with 116 liver, livermorium as the top result, which in this case means false. So this is a boolean based blind SQL injection. We can't, we can use SQL injection, but we can't actually return any results to the page. What we can do is we can query it and ask, does the first letter equal this? Does the second letter equal this? Does the third letter equal this? And slowly retrieve the flag by determining what order the results come in. Hopefully that makes sense. Let's jump over to a script and try this out. So I'm going to open up exploit.py. I'm going to copy over the scripts that I put together. So we need to go and update the port number on this. Let me take a copy of that. That's the only thing that's changed. And essentially, so we know that the start of the flag is going to be flag and then the curly brace. So the next character we want to try and find out is the sixth element. And we've got a while loop here and say while the flag while the last character of the flag doesn't equal the curly brace that we're looking for, the closing curly brace, we're going to loop through the character list of, we know it's lowercase letters, because it said here lowercase letters and underscores. So we're going to check underscores and lowercase letters. I'm checking underscores first, because I'm assuming there'll be more than one underscore in there, whereas there might not be, you know, there might only be one of each lowercase character. A lot of characters won't show up, so this should be a little bit quicker. And we know that this is only going to show up once, so there's no point checking that at the beginning each time. Might not make too much of a difference in this case, but uh, yeah, we're going to loop through all of those characters, and then we've just got this data put together, so that's our post data as we had here. We've got a search, which doesn't have anything in it, and then we've got the order, which has the exact same statement in it. The only difference is we've just swapped out these 
values so that we're looping through the index is going to change each time so once we find the next character it's, this is going to go up to seven it's going to go up to eight as you can see down here and the character that we're checking at the time is here in this list so we send that off we're using beautiful soup to parse the html that comes back and we're looking for the contents of the first td element so let's go back to burp you can see here this is the td here it's the first one that shows up on the page and we basically know that if it comes back with 116 it means the condition was false so if it comes back and says we're che checking the first letter let's say and we check it with an a lowercase a it's going to come back 116 so we know that's not the correct one try b try c try d etc when we do get the correct one it's going to append it to the flag it's going to print it out so we can track it as it's going and we're going to update the index so we can move on to the next character and just break this loop Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Let's try it out. You could add something in the background. You could have some loading something here or, or something to say what character is being tested if you want to track the speed. But let's just leave this running. I'll speed up the process so it doesn't take up too much time. Okay, so it took about a minute total and we have back our flag, which is flag order by blind, which very much describes the challenge. And I'll put this script on my GitHub, so let me just open this up. You can have a look in here in CTF, in CTF events. I put together scripts for different challenges from different competitions, so you can check that out. Also, for learning stuff like this, particularly SQL injection and web vulnerabilities, I recommend the Portswigger Web Security Academy. I've got a list of different CTF resources and pen testing resources and stuff here, which I highly recommend. But if we go to, where is it, latest topics, no, let's go Academy. Oh, we're already on the Academy. Uh, so we've got learning materials and we've got labs here, basically. So you can go through the materials for each topic and then you can do labs in that topic as well so in this case you've got SQL injection you've got a lot of different difficulty levels and I would really recommend this for anybody who's trying to learn web security stuff you see some of them I haven't solved there's some new ones but unfortunately whenever I did do this I used the burp suite trial so you're able to use the burp collaborator quite a lot of challenges particularly the higher difficulty challenges need burp collaborator so if you don't have a pro license or you've already used the trial up, you just can't solve those challenges basically. The next challenge is called Hacker Tees and the description says we all love our Hacker T-shirts, make your own custom ones and we don't have any source code to look at so let's just open up the website and see what we've got. We've got this design your own t-shirt where you've got a command box here and you can select a colour as well for the font and then we've just got a button to click on. There's not much else, we've got this admin link up here, let's check that first of all. And we can see whenever we try to access admin, it says this page can only be seen internally, which is localhost 5000. So presumably our goal is going to be to retrieve the flag from this admin page. And to do that, we need to be operating from the system that the flag is stored on, that the admin page is stored on. Or find some way to trick the system into thinking we're in that location. So let's go back. Let's just try and first of all, just try and put something in. We'll put in test here create a t-shirt and we get back this t-shirt and we can see that test is printed on the front of it. So the first thing we might want to do is try and see can we let's put a script in here we might want to try and have this connect back to our server to see what we get. I'm just going to put an alert just to see does this render? Do we get an alert? What happens? And it doesn't render. We don't get an alert. Let's go back and Let's change that. Let's say document.write and put 123. And in this case, it writes 123 to the t shirt. So let me open up a Hacktrix page here server side XSS dynamic PDF. So we're just going to go through and have a look, see if there's some payloads that we can try out here. We might want to try and load an iframe as it says here. Let's take a copy of this one first of all. We'll go back and paste that in. Does this work? And it does, you can see that prints onto the t-shirt and we can see a temp directory, a path name, protocol, etc. What else have we got here? We've got another one with an iframe. 
So this is an iframe with a window dot location. So it's just put an iframe of the same page into the into the page. Let's try and let's add on to that admin. Check custom. So a couple of things to note here. We've got a error which is telling us that there was a problem generating a PNG, and we now know that WK HTML2 image is being used. So we might want to go and search for that. See, is there any cross-site scripting vulnerabilities? Does anything come up if we search server-side request forgery and let's say CTF write-up? And maybe there'll be some interesting write-ups to go and have a look through to see if we can find some similar payloads, some similar techniques. The other thing to note is what is the actual error? So why did it report an error? And that was because it's appended admin, which we did append to the window.href.location, I think that was being used, which isn't valid. Let's go back and try this again. And let's actually just say, we just want the iframe source to be admin on the same site. So we'll do that and we'll get this message this time, blocked access to file. So they're unable to access it the same way we are. It's not, it's not able to access the admin page. What if we tried to put in here, uh, let's do localhost 5000 admin. And we get another error this time. We've got a parse error, shrink to fit. Okay, argument key not recognized. So we can keep playing around with this. The other thing that I'd mentioned is we might want to try and see if we can get a connection back to our own server. So let me do, let's do sudo python dash m http dot server port 80. And let's use ngrok. So you can do ngrok http and then the port in our case ngrok http 80. And now this is exposing my local host port 80 to this web address, which means if we go and try and access this in a browser, you can see we've got access to whatever was in that directory. And now I can see that there was a, con there was a connection made on both ngrok and on the Python HTTP server as well. So what we're interested in doing here is going back to, oh, where is it? Let's go back here and let's do scripts. We'll load a script from source. So we'll do script src equals, and then I'm going to pass in that ngrok address. And then let's say exploit.js, which we don't have created yet. Let's submit that. And this loaded, it didn't show anything on the page. Let's have a look at our HTTP request and we'll see that we've got this request for exploit.js. So we can put together an exploit.js file, which will be loaded and hopefully executed. We could test it out quite easily by creating our exploit.js and just putting in another redirection or a HTTP request to our server again to see if it's executed. Let's also go back to hack tricks. So there were plenty of other options that we could try here as well. I did run through some of these whenever I was trying it initially. I also found that there was a presentation. Let me take a copy of this. There was this presentation on Google Docs, which had Naham Sek as a, an author. I think this was a DEF CON presentation, actually, which has some of the same payloads in here. So if you're ever doing a CTF and you can find, you're researching a challenge and you find some documentation from somebody who's involved in the CTF or who's created challenges for the CTF, it's probably a good avenue to explore. So yeah, you can go through this, check out the iframe stuff, and I don't think this actually has the technique that we're going to use. Um, what we are going to use is the XML HTTP request. So the idea here is if we can get the admin or the system to execute our JS, and we create a new HTML, a new HTTP request, and then request the local host admin page. So that's going to return that to them on the server, and then all we need to do is exfiltrate that data. So you can see in this case, this is to read a local file, so it's kind of similar to what we want to do, except we want to make a GET request to the admin page on the local host. Because the request comes from the local host, it will be accepted. And then once it's loaded, once that's 
once the body has come back, we then want to send that back to us. So in this case, this is set to document.write the response.txt. That's not what we want. We want the response.txt to be sent back to our ngrok server. So we're going to do it slightly differently. Let me take a copy of the code that I used for this one. Paste this in here. I need to go and get this new ngrok address. Take a copy of that. And essentially what we're doing, so we're going to submit the same thing again. Let me go back. We're going to submit this again. The script source is our ngrok server exploit.js. The server is going to load that JS and then it's going to start executing. And what it's going to execute is it's going to create this new HTTP request. It's going to request the local host admin page on port 5000. And then we've got this set up to basically say once this page loads, get the response.txt of it, get, get the response text, so the whole response body, base64 encode it, and then create a new HTTP request and make a request to our ngrok server with the result of that previous response and send it. So down here, this is where we're sending this request at the top and it's going to send, it's going to wait for this on load to trigger, so once the page is loaded, and when the page is loaded, it's going to send another HTTP request to our local server with the flag. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Let's try it out. So we'll submit that. We're going to take a look at our HTTP server. And we've got back this base64 encoded flag, which is actually the whole response. So we can just go and decode this. I'll go over to, let's go over to the Hackverter. It's automatically decoded it, and you can see that we've got our flag down here on the right. The next challenge is called 2 for 1, and the description says, Need to keep things secure? Try out our safe, the most secure in the world. Uh, we've got no source codes download, so let's just open up the website and take a look at it. We can see that we've got this login page with a username, password, and a two-factor one-time pass. So we'll go and create a user, first of all. We could try admin to see if we can register that as a user. Something I'd normally try. Uh, we can't, so it says it's taken. So worth bearing in mind, the goal is probably going to be to try and get hold of the admin account or to get some information off the admin. So what I've done there is just created a user with the username test and the password test. Let's have a look at the request, which we can see here. So that was all sent across, and then we've got this OTP auth back which is basically our QR code. Now if you have Google Chrome I believe you can just go ahead and use an extension for this. I'm actually using my phone here so I'm just going to add this to my phone with the Google Authenticator app and let's go ahead and sign in. So obviously you can't see this but I'll just type this in from here. It is 148056 and we'll sign in. So we'll have a look around first. We've got this secrets page where we can create a new secret. Let's see if we can put in a script or something here. Let's do scripts and I'll just put in an alert. Create secret and then we can view it or delete it. So we'll try and view it. It asks us for that one time pass again. So 105046 show secret. Okay, so it doesn't actually execute. So the chances are that the admin has a secrets page like this and it has a flag in it and we're going to want to try to get that. So you can see we've got this post request here, show secret, and it takes the OTP, the one time pass, and the secret ID and then it's going to return the value. So let's see what else we've got here. We've got a logout function and settings. There's not really much else to look at. We can reset our passwords. So we can provide a password and our one time pass. And we can also reset our two factor authentication code. And we've got a feedback form here as well. So let's try and do something like we did in the last challenge. We'll create a HTTP server. I'm just going to use an alias I've got set up, but the command was shown in the last challenge. And then we'll use ngrok again on HTTP port 80. Let's grab a copy of this address. 
and then we'll go here and do scripts. We'll set the source to equal our address. We're going to set up an exploit.js or something soon, so let's put that in there. And we'll submit that, and we just want to make sure that we get a connection back. So if we do, we know that we can inject some JavaScript here, or we can create a link to some JavaScript and have the admin execute it. Okay, so you can see that it was executed, it was it made a connection out to our server. So as we did in the last video, let's try and put together some JavaScript to actually execute. And the goal here essentially we want to reset the admin's password, but before we can reset the admin's password, we need to get the two factor authentication code. And we know that we have this option here, reset two FA. So let's click that. And whenever we click it, we get our QR code back. We'll have a look at our post request. And we've got this post request to reset to FA. And it doesn't take in any parameters. It's obviously got a cookie set. And then it comes back with that OTP auth for our user with a new secret. And we can go and take this to a website. We can actually use Google to generate the QR code. So without wasting too much time here, let's just go and take a look at the scripts that I put together. So we're going to open up first of all 2FA xfill.js. And similar to our last challenge, we've got a HTTP request which is being set up here. We're going to make a post request to the 2FA, so that was just the address that we saw here. We've got credentials set to true, and we're going to exfiltrate the response. So just like we did, literally exactly like we did in the last example. So we're going to get the response in Base64 encoded. We're going to create a new request, and we're going to send that back to our ngrok server. So first thing we want to do is update the port in this URL. And the next thing I want to do is update the ngrok address. And we'll add this here. That should be fine. So we want to update this to 2FA xfill.js. We submit that. And hopefully, so it made the request. Oh no, sorry, that was our old request. It made the request now to 2FA xfill.js and we've got a 200 OK and then it made the second request with the flag which is actually a base64 encoded secret. So let's go and decode this. You could take this to Cyberchef or the Hackverter in Burp Suite or something. I'm just going to pass this to base64-d and then we get our secret. So what we can do is take this URL, let me go and grab this Google URL. We can essentially generate the barcodes here. So we're going to update the secret to the one that we just retrieved. Right, where is it? Everything else is the same because I just grabbed this earlier. But you can update the whole URL if need be here. That's going to give us a new QR code, and this is the QR code of the admin. So I'm going to add this on my Google Authenticator on my phone, and let's go and take a look at our next script. So let's open up Codium reset password.js. And again, this is just a form based on our password reset. So you can just try this out yourself, first of all, and see what happens in Burp Suite whenever you reset the password. You can also just have a look at the source code and go and have a look at the the form that's being sent off. So you can actually see we've got a OTP, password, and password2. They're the parameters. It's also going to be in JSON format, so we need to make sure that's accounted for in our script. Uh, so that's essentially what we're doing here. So let me take a copy again of the new port. Oh, this is set to the correct port, okay. And we're going to update the password to admin and we're going to set the OTP, so I'll set this in a second just before we send this off. You could actually put these in, put this in script tags and just put it on the, just enter it in here as well rather than providing the script as a source. But we'll send that off, we're going to, well we're going to open the request here. I have this set up just so that we actually retrieve the response because at the start I wasn't getting, it wasn't working for me at the response and I wanted to find out what the response text was. 
So I'll show that as well. Let's actually update our ngrok address for that. And yeah, we want to make sure it's in JSON format. We've got this set as well to json.stringify. And then it's just going to send that off. So let's go and try it out. Oh, I need to update the OTP. So let me just first of all change this to reset password.js. So that's ready to go. And then we need to update the OTP as well. That is 654929. And we also need to take the space out here of the URL. All right, so we'll submit this quickly before the OTP regenerates. And we're going to get a response here, hopefully, with whatever occurs. There's our reset password.js. And here is the flag. So the flag in this case should hopefully just be the response saying that everything went OK. Let's try and echo that out to base64-d. Success true. OK. So originally I was getting an error. I was getting OTP invalid. So setting this up was just a little bit of debugging. It's not actually required for the exploit at all. And that is that. So we've reset the password. Now hopefully we can just go and log into this new account. Let's go and log out of our current one. Let's put in admin and the password admin. And one last time we'll need to put in our OTP. It's 949399. We logged in. Okay, one more time. Actually we need to view the flag so we need to do it again. 949399. Show secret and there is our flag. So just a quick recap, we created an account, we logged in, we submitted some XSS in order to load this 2FA XFIL script, which will exfiltrate the two-factor authentication code, which we could go and use with the Google Authenticator. So you can see the URL here. You can just update the URL to get the QR code and then scan it with GAuth on your phone or in Google Chrome. And then, with our new OTP codes, we were able to use the XSS again in the feedback form in order to force the admin to reset the password to a password of our choice. And then we logged in with that new password and the OTP that we'd also exfiltrated. And that's going to wrap it up for this video. As you can see, there's a lot of challenges I didn't solve here, so I'm looking forward to seeing some write-ups. I didn't really have time to go through a lot of these to be honest, so I just decided to focus mostly on the web category. But I hope you've enjoyed this video anyway, if you have any questions or comments, leave them down below, thanks.